Okay guys, Timmy coming at you. Today I'm going to go over the uh, signs and symptoms and some of the pathophysiology associated with um, hypo and hyperkalemia. So just a couple of things before we begin, just as a review, right? When you think about electrolytes, you think about the systems of the body that produce electricity. And what are those two systems, right? We know this, right? The heart produces electricity, electrocardiogram, and uh, the nervous system. So if you think, or if the doctor thinks somebody's got Dane Bramage, they do an EEG, an electroencephalogram, right, to measure the electrical activity of the brain. And what produces that electrical activity? Electrolytes. So. When you think electrolytes, you think about the heart and the nervous system for the most part. Now, when you talk about electrolytes, one of the things that's important to remember is where they're located in the body, right? So again, I try to simplify things. So in this case, you probably learned that there are three compartments in the body. There's the well, really two. There's the intracellular and then the extracellular. And then the extracellular is kind of broken up into two parts, which uh, includes the blood and the interstitial space. To keep things simple, look, electrolytes, they're either highly concentrated in the cell or the blood. All right, we'll just leave it at that. Now, when we talk about potassium, potassium is highly concentrated in the cell right? And it's lowly concentrated in the blood. And the normal blood levels for potassium are 3.5 to 5.5. And when you talk about electrolytes, they're measured in what they're called milliequivalents per liter. Now look, 3.5 to 5.5, that's kind of a narrow range. So potassium levels have the ability to fluctuate depend on depending on certain conditions and because the amount of potassium in the blood is relatively low and you have to maintain that to maintain homeostasis then even small changes in your potassium level can have profound effects on your body all right so again potassium is highly concentrated in the cell and lowly concentrated in the blood and the only way to get potassium from the cell into the blood is it has to go through a specific potassium ion channel. Now, the only way to move potassium from the blood into the cell is to pump it in because you got to work against a concentration gradient. And we know that our buddy, our pal, the sodium potassium pumperoni, and that requires ATP, right? That will take two potassiums that were in the blood and it will pump them into the cell and it takes at the same time three sodiums that were in the cell and pumps them into the blood. Because you're working against the concentration gradient, that requires ATP. Now, a couple of things that are really important, and if you understand this, it's going to help you um, with understanding some of the problems associated with hyper and hypokalemia, right? Number one, insulin stimulates the sodium potassium pump, right? So when insulin's around, it's going to stimulate the pump and it's going to take potassium and drive it, pump it back into the cell right and when do you have insulin around when your blood sugar is high right so if you ate some I don't know Captain Crunch with crunch berries or fruity pebbles that stuff's nauseating by the way your blood sugar is going to go up and that's going to cause the beta cells of the pancreas to release insulin and it's going to put glucose into the cell but it's also going to stimulate that sodium potassium pump to drive potassium in the cell number two epinephrine, adrenaline. 
that stimulates the sodium potassium pump as well. So always keep that in mind. All right. Now, let's look at this for a minute. We know that potassium is highly concentrated in the cell and it's lowly concentrated in the blood. And for the most part, this is very important, the kidneys control long-term electrolyte levels. So let's take a look at the kidneys real quick. I just want to show you a few things. All right? You learn this, you got the kidney, and it's made up of a gazillion of these things called nephrons, right? And the job of the nephron, this is very important, the job of the nephron is to filter the plasma of the blood, the watery part of blood. And what's in plasma? Electrolytes, right? Now, a couple of things that you should know. Number one, potassium and hydrogen ions, and we learned about free-floating hydrogen ions, they're acid, right? Potassium and hydrogen ions have a difficult time being filtered by the glomerulus, right? So they don't get filtered into the glomerular tubes, right? The nephron tubes. Instead, those guys stay in the blood, right? So they're in the blood. So potassium and hydrogen ions remain in the blood. So to get rid of potassium and hydrogen ions, the kidney has to actively take them from the blood and filter them or secrete them into the collecting tubules, meaning they can't be filtered, so they have to actively be pumped um, through the blood into the collecting tubules where they're going to get peed out. Now, Watch, if you have an acidosis, that means you got more free-floating hydrogen ions in the blood than normal. What normally happens is this. In the nephron, sodium can be filtered by the glomerulus and it will end up in the collecting tubules. And normally what happens is potassium gets exchanged for sodium in the blood. So sodium got filtered into the collecting tubules and if it remains there it's going to get peed into the toilet. Potassium remains in the blood. So one of the ways that you get rid of potassium, excess potassium, is by exchanging it for sodium. So sodium will come back into the blood and potassium will get into the collecting tubules and peed out. Now, again, what's more important to maintain your pH or to maintain your potassium levels? Well, I'm here to tell you, it's more important to maintain your pH, right? So watch. In a situation where there's an acidosis, where there's a lot of hydrogen ions floating around in the blood, and remember, hydrogen ions, just like potassium, can't leave the blood. They have to be actively pumped out. So if there's increased amounts of hydrogen ions in the blood, normally what will happen is, as I explained, potassium and sodium are exchanged. So you got potassium in the, still in the blood, and then you have sodium that was filtered by the glomerulus. Now normally, you're going to exchange potassium for sodium, but you have an acidosis, so you have more hydrogen ions floating in the blood. In this case, what happens is the hydrogen ions get dumped into the urine, and the sodium gets brought back into the blood. So instead of exchanging sodium and potassium, the kidney exchanged sodium and hydrogen ions. So you pee out more hydrogen ions. The result is, is that your pH drops, but that leads to an elevated level of potassium in the blood. So an acidosis, 
causes hyperkalemia. And that's one of the reasons it's, acidosis causes hyperkalemia is because of that exchange process. Now, let's look at this. And if you watch that acid-base balance, um, which way the equation goes, then this should make sense to you. Now, watch. If you have an alkalosis, an alkalosis, meaning you have decreased amounts of hydrogen ions, right? So if you have decreased amounts of hydrogen ions, this system is going to cause sodium is going to get filtered, but now instead of exchanging hydrogen ions for sodium, you're going to exchange more potassium ions for sodium and reabsorb hydrogen ions back into the blood. You have a deficiency of hydrogen ions with an alkalosis. There's less of them. So what does the kidney do? The kidney, instead of secreting the hydrogen ions, keeps them and just simply gets rid of more potassium. So in an alkalosis, less hydrogen ions, you will have less potassium. So an alkalosis leads to hypokalemia. All right. Now, one of the things you learned in advanced, even in general you should have learned it, I, I believe, is you learned the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism. So the hormone aldosterone is released from the adrenal cortex and one of its functions is to affect this end portion, the squiggly portion called the distal convoluted tubules. All right. Now, just bear with me here a minute. I'm going to try one of my stupid drawings. So what I'm going to do is show you a blown up version of the distal convoluted tubules. Now remember that these little capillaries, they parallel, right? They follow the collecting duct. So that's where stuff gets reabsorbed or stuff gets secreted. And finally, you make some urine. So what we have here is we have the distal convoluted tubules, right? We have the cell membrane of the distal convoluted tubules, and then we have these paratubular capillaries, right? The little blood vessels. Now, in the distal convoluted tubules, you got our buddy, our pal, the one and only sodium potassium pump. And what the sodium potassium pump does in the distal convoluted tubules is it pumps Believe it or not, sodium and potassium. Just write that down. So in this case, because the sodium potassium pump is embedded in the cells that make up the distal convoluted tubules, when that pump is stimulated, it's going to pump sodium, three sodiums back into the blood, and then it's going to take the two potassiums that were in the blood and pump them into the urine. And you learn that the osmotic effect of sodium is going to draw water from the distal convoluted tubules back into the blood, right? So wherever sodium goes, water follows for the most part. Now, this is important. Aldosterone stimulates that sodium potassium pump all right. So, again, at least in the kidney, one of the ways that you get rid of potassium is by stimulating the sodium-potassium pump through aldosterone. 
So aldosterone stimulates the sodium potassium pump in the distal convoluted tubules. It's going to take sodium that was going to get peed into the toilet, right? So this is soon to be urine, right? So when aldosterone is around, it's going to stimulate that sodium potassium pump and pump three sodiums back into the blood and then pump two potassiums into what's soon to be urine and then you're going to pee them into the toilet. And again, when you take sodium back into the blood, water is going to follow. So when aldosterone is around, you're going to produce less urine. And that makes sense too because the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism is stimulated in a response to a drop in blood pressure in the kidney. And one of the ways that you can make your blood pressure go up is by increasing your blood volume. All right, so what did we learn? We learned that the um, insulin and epinephrine stimulate the sodium potassium pump and um, aldosterone stimulates the sodium potassium pump. And that's very important when you talk about the different causes of high and low potassium. All right, so Let's talk about that for a little bit. Now, these are the common causes of hypokalemia, right? And, you, and again, look, if you understand what's going on, you don't have to memorize this stuff, right? It's really important, all right? So here we go, watch. One of the things that can cause um, low potassium is high levels of aldosterone and that's seen in Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease is or Cushing's syndrome is basically where the adrenal cortex produces too much aldosterone, elevated levels of aldosterone Right? Elevated levels of DHEA. And that's kind of the mother of all hormones. So if you're a woman and you have Cushing's, elevated levels of DHEA get converted to testosterone. That's why women with Cushing's, they start getting facial hair and more body hair. And in men, right, that it's converted to estrogen. So guys get man boobs, they lose facial hair, they lose muscle mass. So in Cushing's elevated aldosterone, elevated DHEA, and more importantly, elevated levels of cortisol. Cortisol is the chronic stress hormone and it's the most powerful anti-inflammatory, but the other thing it does is it increases your blood sugar, all right? And when we talk more um, uh, in the next uh, section of the class on uh, the endocrine system, you'll learn more about that. Now, non-potassium sparing diuretics, right? One of the big ones you probably heard of is spironolactone or eldactone. Right? L dactone. Now, watch. Oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. All right, don't hate. This is non-potassium sparing diuretics, not potassium sparing. See, I don't read either. Non-potassium sparing diuretics like Lasix, right? So let's talk about that. The non-potassium sparing diuretics. If you recall from your study, 
of the nephron. And I hope um, what you're understanding is that the kidneys are intimately involved in maintaining pH and electrolyte and fluid balance. So if your kidneys are jacked up, you get jacked up. Now, quick overview of the nephron. You got the afferent arterial, then you got the ball of capillaries, right, that filters. So think of this like a spaghetti strainer. Then you got Bowman's capsule that catches the plasma of the blood. And then what's not filtered leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. And then the efferent arterial forms a network of capillaries that surround the collecting tubules called the paratubular capillaries. All right. Now, the first part of the collecting tubules is the proximal convoluted tubules. And then as you can see, it kind of dips out, right, and thins out, and then goes into this loop of Don Henley, right? It's really not the loop of Don Henley, but it's a loop of Henley. And as you can see, it thins out, and then even on the ascending limit, thins out, but then you have where it thickens up a little bit. It's this part where I'd like to talk to you about it. That's called the thickened portion of the ascending limb. So let me do one of my stupid drawings here. So you got the blood, and then you've got the thin portion of the ascending limb. And then I'm going to make it a little thicker here. So this is the thickened portion of the ascending limb. I'm going to write that down. There's cells that make this up. And in those cells, there is proteins that make it up, right? And these proteins transport electrolytes, what is soon to be urine in the thickened portion, back into the blood. And the electrolytes that they transport are sodium, potassium, and two chlorides. Now this is very important. In order for sodium, potassium, and two chlorides to get reabsorbed back into the blood, and again, when you reabsorb sodium, water that was going to get peed into the toilet is going to get reabsorb back into the blood. So you'll make less urine and you'll have a greater blood volume. Now, in people with high blood pressure or congestive heart failure, more on that later, there is a drug out there that blocks the ability of chloride to get reabsorbed. And if you don't reabsorb two chlorides, then you don't reabsorb potassium and you don't reabsorb sodium. So sodium, potassium, and chloride remain in the thickened portion and what's soon to be urine. And the more sodium you have in the thickened portion, the more water stays with it. So the more water you pee out, the more sodium you pee out, and in particular, the more potassium you pee out. So this is a non-potassium sparing diuretic. And because it works in the loop of Don Henley, it's called a loop diuretic. And that loop diuretic is called Lasix or furosemide. And this is a common drug that you'll be giving. Um, you work on a medical surgical floor or a cardiac unit, you'll be giving this literally every day. In the ICU, you'll be giving it IV on the floor typically, orally. Now, this is a potent diuretic because the more stuff
electrolytes that you have in what's soon to be urine, the more urine you produce. So this is a powerful diuretic. And because you lose potassium, it's a non-potassium sparing diuretic. So one of the ways that potassium levels drop is with these non-potassium sparing diuretics, and Lasix being a big one. Now, cortical steroid medication. Cortical steroid medication mimic aldosterone. And again, what does aldosterone do? Aldosterone stimulates the sodium potassium pump. So if you're taking a medicine that mimics aldosterone, that pump is going to be stimulated. You are going to pump back into the blood three sodiums and you're going to pump two potassiums into what's soon to be urine. So you're removing the potassium from the blood and pumping it into the urine so that's going to lower the blood level of potassium. That's why people when they take that they get um, they get puffy, they retain water. All right. Diarrhea, that, that's an easy one. Cut it out, right? Where do you get your electrolytes from? You eat it, right? You eat and drink electrolytes. So if that stuff is going through you like a jet fighter, right, a jet engine, then you can't reabsorb that, those electrolytes back into the blood. And if you can't reabsorb them into the blood, or absorb them into the blood, then they'll end up in the toilet and that will develop hypokalemia. I explained to you the alkalosis. Now remember, al the alkalosis will result in more potassium, or more hydrogen ions staying in the blood because you have a decreased amount of hydrogen ions in the alkalosis and that will cause more potassium to be excreted into the urine. So when an alkalosis develop, you develop hypokalemia. Now, I forgot to mention this. This is very important. If you think of this, that an acidosis and a hyperkalemia, they go together. And an alkalosis and hypokalemia go together. Now, an acidosis decreases neural activity. Nerves don't fire as well. So, what do you think high potassium is going to do? If these two go together, yup, you got it. High potassium decreases neural activity, right? Because they go together. I'm spitballing here, hoping, living on a prayer. Come on, guys. If an acidosis decreases neural activity, what do you think an alkalosis does? All right, cut it out. Right, that increases neural activity. And because an alkalosis and hypokalemia go together, what do you think low levels of potassium do? Come on, I'm spitballing here. That's right, they increase neural activity. All right. All right. Now, insulin overdose. Explain that. In an insulin overdose, what does insulin do? Insulin stimulates the sodium potassium pump in cell membranes. So what is it going to do? It's going to pump three sodiums out of the blood, or out of the cell into the blood, and it's going to pump two potassiums from the blood and pump them into the cell. So an insulin overdose can lead to hypokalemia. Epinephrine does the same thing. Epinephrine stimulates the sodium potassium pump. So that's why high levels of epinephrine can lead to hypokalemia. All right. So 
those are some of the causes, right? And I hope I um, explained that. I apologize for messing up. Remember, it's the non-potassium sparing diuretics that cause hypokalemia, and that makes sense. You're not keeping potassium in the blood. You're getting rid of it. And Lasix is the big one, and I showed you how that worked. All right? And I explained to you how aldosterone works. Now, watch. What are some of the clinical manifestations of hypokalemia? First of all, we got to go back to that nerve thing. All right? hate to do this to you, but guys, this is what I'm trying to do. If you understand how this works, and, and again, it, I'm, I'm not asking a lot, right? You covered this stuff in AMP. Now I'm asking you to start applying it. And if you apply it and you understand it, you'll never have to remember the signs and symptoms of an electrolyte disturbance because you can figure them out. All right? Now, look, let me give you, an, and I asked you to watch this, remember? Right? You got this. This is the node of Ranvier. So in nerves of the body, this is where you actually produce the electrical activity to, to make the nerve produce an electrical impulse. All right? Now, in order for a nerve to fire, sodium from the blood has to leak in to that nerve. All right? And if sodium leaks in, in and enough sodium leaks in, it's going to cause the nerve to fire. All right, what's your problem? You have low potassium in the blood. You have hypokalemia. Now, this is important. Low potassium in the blood makes sodium leak in faster and easier. So, if your <clears throat> excuse me, if your potassium levels are low, sodium leaks in easier and faster. So that means that nerves fire more frequently. And if nerves that innervate muscles fire more frequently, you will start to get twitchy, right? You'll start to have involuntary muscle contractions, right? You start getting like flippy, like your arms and legs just start spasming. Now, if your potassium level begins to drop even lower, then these nerves will start firing so fast that you won't have time for your muscles to relax. So you can go into what's called tetany. All right? This is what I'm asking you to know, right? In order for a nerve to fire, sodium has to leak in. If low potassium makes the nerve more leaky to sodium and more sodium floods in, the nerve will fire more frequently. And nerves that innervate muscles, the muscles will start becoming twitchy. And as the potassium begins to drop, the nerve fires so frequently that you can't relax the muscle and you will get tetany. So remember, low potassium increases neural stimulation, right? So if it's low enough in the brain, right, in your brain, because your brain's made of nerves, that can lead to seizures, all right? So when you think about low potassium, think about its effects on the nerve. And in order for a nerve to fire, sodium has to leak in. So 
if low potassium makes sodium leak in more and faster, the nerves will fire more frequently. So you start getting twitchy. That's why they tell you, look, if you get a muscle cramp, a muscle cramp is the result of a nerve firing frequently and not allowing that muscle to relax. So if your blood levels of potassium are low, right, and you get cramps, what do they tell you to do? Eat a banana or drink orange juice, your potassium's low. Or put a bar of soap underneath your sheets. I really don't know what that means, but I read that in the Reader's Digest. Tell me you're with me on that. Say yes, I'll be very happy. All right? Now, the other thing I asked you to look at the video was the cardiac action potential. So remember, I told you that you look at the nervous system, right? And you look at the heart, right? So this is this is the cardiac action potential, right? Or basically, that's a p action, yeah, potential that action potential is a fancy way of saying that how does a nerve or the heart produce electrical activity so when it fires right that's the action potential now when you looked at that you remember you saw the P wave then you saw the little delay to allow the A tray to contract then you saw the QRS right so P U, R, S, and then you see the T wave, right? And I explained to you what was happening at each part. Now, and I explained to you in that cardiac action potential that depolarization or the atria and the ventricles actually firing and where do you see the atria and the ventricles firing? The atria, it's the P wave, and the ventricles, it's the QRS. That's called depolarization, and this is very important. And what causes the heart to depolarize is a result of sodium coming into the heart cell through leak and voltage-gated channels. All I want you to know right now is what causes the heart to depolarize is sodium coming into that heart cell. That's depolarization. What causes it to repolarize or get back to that resting membrane potential where I can do it all over again? That is a result of potassium leaving the cell. So potassium leaving the heart cell causes repolarization of the heart or resetting of the heart so it can contract again. That's your hope, right? Now, where do you see repolarization of the ventricles on the EKG? You see it on the T wave. So, the first place that you are going to notice an abnormal potassium in the blood, in this case a low level of potassium in the blood, hypokalemia, your eye should immediately go to the T wave on the EKG. So the first place that you're going to notice a change due to potassium on the EKG is the T wave. and what happens is it just takes repolarization longer because there's less potassium in the blood. So it takes longer to reach that equilibrium for potassium in the blood in the cell. So what you're going to see is you're going to see this is a normal EKG. And then as the potassium begins to drop, you're going to see the T wave become flattened and prolonged. That's because repolarization of the heart 
is happening slower. All right? Now, if that potassium continues to drop, if that potassium continues to drop, now this is important. Let's clean up some of this stuff. All right? What's going to happen is this. Low potassium in the blood makes sodium leak in more and faster. So the heart, because more sodium, will fire quicker. So the heart becomes irritable right and it can start firing off on its own so low potassium causes the heart and in particular the ventricles of the heart the primary pumps of the heart to become irritable so they will start firing off irregularly so you will get at least in this class you'll get these goofy heartbeats so if you see the ventricles acting goofy, and they weren't acting goofy before, but an hour ago you gave a patient 80 milligrams of Lasix, and now their heart's getting goofy, all right? The ventricles are getting irritable. You need to check a potassium level, all right? So let's review this. Right? Remember that potassium is involved in producing the electrical activity of nerves and the heart, right? And low potassium in the blood makes sodium leaking quicker. And both in the nerves and the heart, sodium has to leak in for it to fire. So nerves will become more fiery, more irritable, and nerves that innervate muscle. So you're going to get twitch in, and if it's low enough, you can get some tetany. And in the heart, low potassium, you see it first on the T wave because potassium is involved in repolarization, and the T wave shows the repolarization of the ventricles, and it's going to be squished and prolonged so it's going to be flattened and prolonged because taking longer for it to repolarize but low potassium also causes more sodium to leak in so the heart fires quicker and the ventricles in particular become irritable so you'll start getting these goofy heartbeats and then the causes of hypokalemia. I went over that and I explained those to you. Remember, insulin and epinephrine stimulate the sodium potassium pump and drive it into the cell. So if you give somebody too much insulin and their blood sugar drops, that's going to cause them to become hypokalemic. And if they have a lot of epinephrine around, that's going to stimulate the sodium potassium pump and they will become hypokalemic as well. Diarrhea, right? You can't absorb it from your GI tract into the blood and you get it from your diet. Cortical steroid medication, that mimics aldosterone, so you need to know what aldosterone does, very important. And if you got a Cushing's disease where you got too much aldosterone and you're in trouble. And then the non-potassium sparing diuretics like Lasix. And make sure you know that mechanism that I talked about, about the sodium, potassium, and the two chlorides. That's really important. All right? Okay, now, let's look at hyperkalemia. That's the opposite of hypo. I'm going to write that down. Just so you know, by me writing that, I wasted 32 seconds of your life that you'll never get back. 
but hopefully I'll make up for it. All right. So high levels of potassium in the blood greater than 5.5. And remember, this is really important, right? Remember that the kidneys control long-term electrolyte balance, right? So if the kidneys fail, all the functions of the kidneys fail. And one of the um, uh, first functions to go is in the kidneys is if stuff has to be actively secreted, right? And I talked to you about the fact that hydrogen ions and potassium ions have to be actively secreted. So if somebody goes into renal failure, what's one of the first functions to go? Actively secreted processes. So that's going to cause the amount of hydrogen ions in the blood to go up. So renal failure leads to acidosis. And because they can't secrete potassium as well, that acidosis and renal failure leads to hyperkalemia. So if somebody's going into renal failure, you got to keep an eye on their pH and their potassium. All right, so let's look at some of the causes, right? Oh, the first one is acidosis. Uh-oh. Right, so go back to that. Remember that in the kidney, Normally, sodium is exchanged for potassium. So you reabsorb sodium and you secrete potassium into the urine. But in an acidosis, sodium is exchanged for hydrogen ions. So that leads to potassium in the blood. So that's how acidosis causes hyperkalemia. The renal failure I just explained, kind of, um, what's that word, that big word, um, serendipitously, thank you. All right, uh, DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis is the result of no insulin, typically, or a type 1 diabetic who's really really sick, right? So let's look at this. What does insulin do to the sodium potassium pump? Insulin stimulates the sodium potassium pump. Can't even tell you how important that is. That's a M pump. All right, so let's look at this. You got your blood, you got a cell. Who cares what cell it is? Then you got that pump, the sodium potassium pump. Need a different color. Right there it is, sodium potassium pump. You got insulin around. When do you have insulin around? When your blood sugar's high, okay? What up, G? See, get it? OG. In order for glucose to go from the blood into the cell, it's got to bind to an insulin receptor, and then that opens up a little glucose gate and allows what up G to go into the cell. So glucose goes into the cell, lowering your blood sugar. What does insulin do, too? It stimulates that sodium potassium pump. So what does it do? It takes two potassiums that were in the blood and drives them into the cell, and three sodiums that were in the cell and drives them into the blood. That's how it works normally. Now, in DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, you don't have insulin. So what's happening? Your blood sugar is through the roof. What up, G? I may have that as an extra credit on the quiz, though, too, just so you know. And when you take test number one, 
Remember that. Hold up, G. Alright? So I'm making this up. Right? This is glucose. Normal blood sugar is between like a 80 and 100. Let's say you don't have insulin, right? So you're a type 1 diabetic. Diabetes mellitus, right? So you don't have insulin. So if you don't have insulin, no insulin, no insulin at the end. Insulin. Okay. Without insulin, the sodium potassium pump is not stimulated. That means two potassiums that were in the blood are going to stay in the blood and three sodiums that were in the cell are going to stay in the cell. The result is, is in DKA, especially in its early stages, that will cause the blood levels to go up and you will have hyperkalemia. Now you're not going to believe this and I've seen nurses do it, right? Somebody comes in with a blood sugar of 1200, 1300. They're not doing so good, right? Because hyperkalemia decreases neural activity, right? So they're kind of out of it. And uh, if the blood sugar gets high enough, they go into a coma, which is the lowest level of neural activity you can have without being dead. So they get the labs back and they see their potassium is like, like seven point two. They're like, oh, oh my God, oh, what are we gonna do? And I tell them just to update their Facebook status. But now watch, if you look, what caused the problem to begin with? Well, they're diabetic and they don't have insulin. So if you give them insulin, insulin's going to lower the blood sugar. It's going to put the glucose into the cell. And, uh-oh, insulin is going to stimulate that sodium potassium pump and drive two potassiums back into the cell and three sodiums into the blood. So knowing that insulin stimulates the sodium potassium pump right if you correct the blood sugar to a large degree you will correct the electrolyte imbalance all right now these two go, kind of go um, hand in hand sickle cell and hemolysis all right now Watch. This could very well be a question on the quiz. Very well. Right? Where are red blood cells? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, just so you know. Um, that means I hate me too. Okay? Red blood cells are in the blood, and red blood cells have a cell membrane, right? Where's potassium always highly concentrated? In the cell, and including a red blood cell. So when they measure your blood, they measure the stuff that's in the plasma of the blood, right? And normally, there is a small concentration of potassium in the plasma. There's more in the red blood cell. Now. If you have sickle red blood cells or something happens to your normal red blood cells, that's a sickle red blood cell. Potassium's highly concentrated there too. And the reason it's called sickle cell anemia is because these sickle red blood cells are much more fragile. So in hemolysis or sickle cell, what happens is the red blood cell lyses and where does all that potassium go? It goes into the plasma of the blood, elevating your blood levels of plasma. So that's why hemolysis, or the destruction of red blood cells, can lead to hyperkalemia. Also, tissue trauma uh, 
right? Really bad, like a real bad car accident where people get like blunt force trauma. That can damage cells, rupture the cell membrane, and it will pour the potassium into the blood. When you give somebody a blood transfusion, sometimes if the needle that you're using to transfuse that blood isn't big enough, as those red blood cells are going through the little needle, they can get lysed and cause temporary hyperkalemia. All right? So that's another one. All right, now, adrenal insufficiency. Adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease is the exact opposite of Cushing's. So in Cushing's disease, you got too much aldosterone. In Addison's disease, you have no aldosterone. And again, the devil's in the details. What does aldosterone do? Well, let's look at the stupid picture. Aldosterone stimulates the sodium potassium pump. It takes two potassiums that were in the blood and pumps them into what's soon to be urine. So you're getting rid of potassium and then you take three sodiums that were gonna be in the urine and instead you pump them back into the blood and the water will follow. But in Addison's disease, you don't have aldosterone. So if you don't have aldosterone, you cannot stimulate the sodium potassium pump in the nephron. The result is, is that you are going to not be able to pump the potassium out of the blood. So the potassium will remain elevated and the sodium will drop in the blood. Also, because the sodium is going to be staying in the distal convoluted tubules along with the water, these people are going to be peeing a ton. So they're going to be always drinking because they're peeing all the time and their potassium level is going to go up. So what do you give them? You give them aldosterone because that's what they're lacking. Just write that down. You got me? And uh, the dude who's most famous for having Addison's disease is um, JFK. JFK. Right? So that's Addison's. I talked about severe trauma just real quick. Real quick. Remember, and it don't make no never mind what cell. You got the blood and you got the cell. So this could be any cell. Potassium is always highly concentrated in the cell. So if you get massive trauma, that's going to cause cell membranes to rupture and the potassium will pour into the blood leading to hyperkalemia. Okay, so we talked about some of the causes of hyperkalemia, right? Now I'm going to talk to you about some of the clinical manifestations. Now, again, look, if you understand how potassium affects nerve conduction and cardiac conduction, that's going to help you explain a lot of the big signs and symptoms associated with it. So in this case, in the case of hyperkalemia, where your blood levels of potassium are high, right? They're in the six, 6.5, right? Seven, as it starts climbing. Now, high levels of potassium in the blood block sodium channels. So in nerves, your brain, motor nerves, right? Sodium has a hard time leaking in. What needs to leak in in order for a nerve to fire? Sodium does. So if high levels of potassium block sodium channels, then sodium can't leak in and the nerve won't fire. So in motor nerves, you will start to get 
muscle weakness. Right? In order for a nerve to contract, or a muscle to contract, it needs a nerve to stimulate it. If that nerve is not being stimulated because sodium isn't leaking in because your blood levels of potassium are high, your muscles are going to become weak. As the potassium goes up, right, 7.58, you can actually get muscle paralysis where this person will not be able to move. Right? And we know the diaphragm, which controls breathing, is a skeletal muscle, right? We can control our breathing. Watch, I'm going to hold my breath. <gasps> See, I'm not breathing right now. So if high levels of potassium in the blood go up, whoops, that didn't make any sense. If potassium levels in the blood go up, you get hyperkalemia. That's going to prevent the diaphragm con from contracting, your intercostal muscles from contracting, so these people can go into um, respiratory distress. Right? Now, the effects on the brain are going to be the same. It's going to su suppress neural activity. So they will become confused, drowsy, right? Mentally, they're going to be really, really slow. So those are the effects on the nervous system. Now, let's look at the effects on the heart, all right? And again, as you go through nursing school, as you matriculate through your process, see, it's 1.56 in the afternoon and I'm bringing you the word matriculate, or more you want. All right, so as you go through the process of nursing school, one of the things you need to keep in mind when you're dealing with a patient and when you're in clinical, you prioritize patient care based on what will kill them first, right? So not being able to breathe, that's bad for you. You should probably write that down. Or if your heart ain't working so good and you're not contracting your heart and sending nice oxygen to your cells, that's a problem. So when you think of potassium, you think it's effect on the heart and the effect on the nerves, all right? Now, watch. What did high levels of potassium in the blood do to sodium channels in nerves? It blocked them. Now we're in the heart. You're never going to guess what high levels of potassium do to sodium channels in the heart. Yup. High levels of potassium block sodium channels, right? So in people with low sodium, or, I'm sorry, high potassium, it's going to block sodium leak channels so the heart will not depolarize as quickly. So what's going to happen to the person's heart rate? The person's heart rate is going to drop. The other thing that's going to happen, again, if you look at the EKG, where do you see potassium? Potassium causes repolarization of the heart. The T wave is where you see the repolarization of the ventricles. So the first place that you're going to see an elevated potassium is on the T wave. And in this case, because your blood levels of potassium are higher, repolarization is going to happen quicker. So the T wave becomes tall and tented. It's shortened and it's tall. So in nursing school, what they do is they teach you this. You're piling up potassium. Get it? You're piling up potassium. So hyperkalemia, one of the first signs is you are going to see a tall, tented T wave. Now, elevated potassium decreases the force of contraction of the heart. So the heart will become weaker. It's not going to contract as good. So that's going to cause a drop in blood pressure. 
yeah. Also, as the potassium level begins to go, right, it becomes higher. The atria are going to be contracting weaker because the electrical activity is decreasing. So you're going to actually lose your P wave, right? You're not going to see atrial depolarization. And remember, sodium causes depolarization of the heart. So it produces the QRS complex. If less sodium is leaking in because your potassium levels are high, it's going to take depolarization of the QRS longer. So another big problem is you will get a widened QRS. And because the ventricles aren't snapping, when they contract, because it's taking a long time, the heart becomes weaker. And then, as the potassium climbs eight, eight and a half, the, this is QRS. See, see how nice it was here, right? Short, bam, contract. Now look, it's wide. And the T wave and the QRS complex kind of mold together and then you get what's called a, a sine wave. And the heart rate's going to be lower, the force of contraction is going to be weaker, and their blood pressure is going to be dropping. This is how they kill people with the lethal injection. The lethal injection is actually potassium. So by injecting potassium into the blood directly, it's going to block sodium channels in the heart. The heart rate's going to slow down. The heart will become sluggish because it's taking longer to depolarize and contract. And then ultimately, if the potassium gets high enough, the heart will stop. That's how they used to stop the heart in heart surgery. They would take a big picture of Kool-Aid, like a Kool-Aid pitcher, it was full of ice potassium solution. They would pour it directly on the heart. The cold reduced the metabolic activity of the heart, and the potassium actually would stop the heart. So high levels of potassium decrease heart activity, so the heart rate's going to drop, and it's going to decrease neuromuscular activity, right? So they will become, the muscles become weak, flaccid and if it gets bad enough you will have muscle paralysis and central nervous system activity is going to decrease as well and remember because the skeletal muscle or the diaphragm is a skeletal muscle and you're not going to be sending nerves to the diaphragm they're going to go into respiratory distress so in terms of your nursing interventions the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you can keep their heart beating and that they're breathing if they can't breathe you intubate them and let a machine do it and then you have to somehow get that potassium down and we learned and I'll never forget it it was a Thursday it was on uh, December 27th right around 203 never forget it we learned that one of the things that stimulates the sodium potassium pumperoni in the cells of your body is our buddy, our pal, insulin. Insulin stimulates the sodium potassium pump. So one of the treatments for hyperkalemia elevated potassium in the blood is insulin and glucose. Insulin stimulates the sodium potassium pump to drive the potassium into the cell and you need to give them glucose as well because you don't want to bottom out their blood sugar. So that's one of the big treatments. All right, now, we went over the causes of hyperkalemia. Then, 
we went over the signs and symptoms. And again, I can't illustrate this enough to you that when you think about potassium, you think about its effects on the nervous system and its effects on cardiac function. All right. I hope this helped.